how, how is that possible? And we said, because we told them, don't touch anything on the table. One time. We just said, don't touch anything on the table. See, that, that didn't happen there by magic. That happened by all the other times where we said, we're going to say it one time, ever, don't do this. And if you do it three years later, you're going to get whipped because that's all there is to it. When you stand there, they believe you. The thing is, they could hear us because we spoke and we meant it. God can be heard by us if we will listen. We're not children anymore. We get disciplined by the world. We get to, and, and God, but I mean, you know, we decide we're going to do what we want to do and bang, we're, you know, running into walls and things are going wrong. But we can learn to hear like those little kids. We're adults. Yes, there's a lot of noise in our lives because we're adults, because of all the things we've gone through. But you can learn, okay? The, the sheep can hear his voice if the sheep want to learn to hear his voice. And that's, again, what I've talked about over and over again is invite God into everything. Start practicing to listen because he will speak to you about everything. Now, here's my latest example. We have a fence that was built on the back of our property by our neighbors. And we didn't pay for it. They wanted it. They built it fine. But they built it on our property. Well, we, we don't care. Well, that house has changed hands a couple times behind us. And now it's our fence and our problem. And it's just rotting in pieces. We, I never had a wooden fence before, and I just waited way too long before I paid any attention to it. And so I power sprayed it, which made it, changed it back to looking like wood. And uh, it, it, and we just looked at it, and we looked at paint and everything, and it was like minimum of $160 to paint it. We just don't think it's worth it. It's so far gone. <coughs> So I'm just like, I don't know. And I talked to my wife. She goes, yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it's worth, worth fixing the thing, you know, because, uh, and uh, I mean, sure, we probably get years more use out of it, but it's so bad. So uh, anyway, I just said, Lord, whatever you want, you know, I just don't really think we should do this. So um, anyway, so uh I was talking to a buddy of mine, a Christian friend of mine on the phone, and for some reason I felt like the Lord wanted me to tell him about the fence. So I'm telling Dennis, now Dennis McMurtry is a guy that can barely take care of himself. He's just almost completely blind. And I'm telling him about our fence. And I'm like, Dennis doesn't care about our fence, why am I doing this? But I, I did. And he goes, well, you know, he goes, if you go to a paint store, a lot of times they'll have return paints and you might be able to find something like that. Well, I knew that because I've been to Lowe's and seen their, you know, things. And he goes, and sometimes they're like, I told him it was $30 a gallon for paint. He said, sometimes like $5 and $10 a gallon. And I'm thinking, still, $60, I don't want to spend $60 on this either. And so anyway, so I go, okay, fine. I told him whatever. So the next day I have to go to the motor place. I'm taking a motor to, and then talk to them and everything. And I'm coming back, and the Lord reminds me of what Dennis said. He said, there's a Sherwin-Williams place go in there. And it's right, literally on the road I'm traveling down. I'm like, okay. And I go in there. So the guy comes to the counter. So I tell him a real brief, this, this fence is garbage. We don't want to spend any money on it. And my buddy said, you might have paint. paint. He goes, oh, sure, let's go back in the back. So we go back, and there's a little stack of cane, paint cans, gallon paint cans, maybe not even 30 of them. He goes, well, let's see what we got here. And he goes, well, that one's deck stain. I need, by the way, I need six gallons. And he goes, and that's one, and that's one, and there's four. And he's looking around, he goes, oh, there's five. And I went, wow, and I stood up and I saw the sixth one. And I said, how much for all those? He goes, oh, a buck a can. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now I know why I told Dennis, <laughs> right? But that, I just had that little tell Dennis, you know? So I, you know, it's like, I felt so stupid talking to him about, you know, but look what God did. Now I'm not saying that God couldn't have said something to be coming down that road, but I think God knew that I probably wouldn't have heard if Dennis hadn't said it out loud. You know what I'm saying? I, I might have heard God, but I just thought it was my own thought, blown it off. But because Dennis planted that in me, I went, well, you know, that's like two confirmations, right? That Dennis says, and then and I hear God's voice. 
So anyway, praise God, right? So $160 to $6, that's a substantial discount. Um, and uh, yeah, well, so we decided to pay the fence and then I, Tom sorted my wife and she paid with the fence. So, <laughs> seriously, I had to pay three hours ready to go and everything. She just went out and she goes, she's just covered, just paint all over and she goes, I love painting. <laughs> okay, hon. <laughs> stay, stay away. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, but, you know, that's that little voice, right? I could have just so easily blown off telling Dennis, you know, but... But that was God. Just open that door. And there was exactly what we needed all in one place for almost nothing. Praise God. Uh, God is so good. And if you if you listen, that's and this is just four days ago, right? Um, five days ago, whatever. Anyway, so praise the Lord. Uh, and I want you to realize that God wants to fill your life with things like this and more significant. Okay, the way God leads and their variety, the inner voice, sometimes outer, but seldom. So a lot of people have walked with the Lord for years and never heard it, what they thought was an audible voice. Okay, every time I thought it was an audible voice, it shocked me and made me jump and look, but nobody around heard it. Okay, but it hasn't been that many, very many times, and they were all to get through my thick skull. So, um, uh, the second way is counsel or prophecy, uh, somebody else speaking. Uh, the third is closing of doors, and not, not open doors, closing of doors. And the, the fourth one is scriptural illumination, and all with peace. Now, there are, I've seen a lot of people get into a lot of serious problems by thinking every open door was God. Okay? Think of all the things with open doors. House of prostitution. Drug dens, bars, okay? That doesn't mean you're supposed to go in because the door is open, okay? God, in his grace and mercy, closes doors, okay, just as he did for Paul and Silas when they took off. Numerous doors were shut before they ended up where they're supposed to, okay? The, a rudder doesn't work on a ship unless the ship is moving. So start moving, start seeking. By the way, this is my second sermon today. Um... <coughs> My daughter called, and the anointing fell, and so that was like an hour right there. Um, anyway, so, and then remember the variety that I mentioned at the beginning. When Jesus first sent out the 72, he said, take all these supplies. The second time he said, or first time he said, don't take anything. The second time he said, take supplies. Okay, we, we have to understand that God will purposefully change things on us. That's why we don't want to get caught in a rut. That's why that's this is how religions get built. God does something one way and then people, this is how we got to do it every time. No, 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 no. Okay? Let God be God. Listen to it. Do it His way. Okay? That's where mistakes are made. So I'm pretty sure I covered all that. And then I talked to you about Sergeant Smitty and him snapping his fingers and the kids hearing. I remember that. Uh, the inner voice um, when uh, Elijah was running from Jezebel, he said, stand on the mountain, I will pass by, and storm, lightning, earthquake, and everything, and then gently and quietly, the voice of God, right? So we need to understand, and this is a, one of the things I, I emphasize to people, because people are so used to being bullied by the world, right? I mean, it's everywhere. You, ever, you never notice when you're watching TV and the commercial get, comes on, it's louder, See, you're being bullied by the world, okay? And, and, the, and the thing is that the Spirit of God wants to speak to you gently. Some of the most powerful actors, people like Clint Eastwood, became icons because when they talked, they made you listen to them. Right? Yeah. Okay. And they, they made you listen to them. They, not anybody can do that, okay? But the fact of the matter is the world wants to bully us with all kinds of things, and the devil does too. When you think, are trying to be led by the Spirit, if you feel this pushing, prompting, urgency, pressure, you know, uh, uh, condemnation, fear, work, anything like that, then you just need to drop it, okay?
Okay, nope, nope, that's not God. Okay, God is gentle. Okay, think. Why don't you feel like before you start feeling like this? Okay, and we were talking the other day, my wife and I and Paul, we were talking the other day about how we could sense the spirit in crisis. When we heard about Paul having a stroke, every bad thought you could imagine came into my head. The repercussions, the things that would happen as a result of us losing Paul. Paul, And yet, I felt this peace in my heart. Even my mind was going, wah, 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 right? But my heart was like, now the same thing has happened to us before when one of our kids disappeared. Okay, one of our children, our youngest, was a kind of a wanderlust. He was out in the yard and died or something. He just decided to go and he left and uh, he was gone. And we're running around and it's like my brain is screaming. But I just checked with my heart, and my heart was at peace, and I knew everything would be okay. It was very hard. It's very hard not to go with all the things you know that could be. But if you consult with the Spirit of God inside you, you can tell when something is uh, urgent and dangerous and something isn't. Okay? And, and so that Spirit is always in you, and it knows. Okay? And of course, we talked about the closing of door and doors. And I don't know, did, did I talk about the closing of doors last time in detail? But Paul and Silas, I think I did. And did I talk about scriptural illumination? I don't think I did that. I think that's where I ended. Okay, let me give you a perfect example of God illuminating scripture in one way. There's many ways he can that happen to us. <clears throat> Many years ago, during one of our prayer meetings, God gave a prophetic word and said that God was going to give us farms. Now, I don't really know, but we were very clear on farms. Maybe it's because our farm was two farms once. I don't know. But we go, okay, fine. We did not go to realtors. We did not go looking for a farm. We did not do anything. We just said, okay, God said that. Okay. About five years later, on the eve of the great snowstorm of 82, if anybody remembers that, they closed down St. Louis. It's huge. Um, the, 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 the Spirit of the Lord, I was coming out of Alton. It had just started to snow on Friday afternoon. And God said to me, go on to 7-Eleven and get an Alton newspaper. We didn't take any newspaper. We certainly didn't take Alton. So I pulled it and I got one. And I left. And I took it home and I threw it on my desk and I just didn't think about it. Paul comes home from work and comes up to my office and I said, oh, something weird happened today. I was out and God told me to get this newspaper. While I'm talking to him, I'm opening it up and looking at it. You know, I kind of look at the front page. And I just open it up randomly and I open it up to the back and there's classified, two big pages of classifieds. And I look down and I'm telling you, one of them went, woo, woo, and it had light around it. Okay? And it said, 85 acre farm for sale. $45,000, which I immediately thought was a inverted typo, yeah. okay, and I was very confused. Now, I'm not going to go into the Miracle Farm. I'll tell you about that some other time, perhaps, but the fact of the matter is, is that that just went boom, and it just lit up. Now, as you may have noticed, Paul is a pretty laid-back guy, okay? It's like, seriously, check, check on your fuel. Hide around a corner, wait for him to come, jump out, say boo, and he'll go, oh, hi. Okay. If, if he noticed you. Uh, I mean, he's just very, very and okay. And so I gave him the paper, I, and I circled it, and I said, read that. And he goes, he goes, he goes I don't know, goes, my heart's beating really fast. And he was like, you know, that's, that's a huge reaction for Paul. That's the equivalent of me going, woo! Okay. okay. Uh, Anyway, and so God, very miraculously, I mean, very miraculously gave us that farm. We tried to call that guy. They had already, he had all, the, the ad went in the paper that afternoon. That was Friday evening. He had already gotten 60 phone calls. His bank wanted to buy it. Other cattle ranchers wanted to buy it. The neighbors of the property wanted to buy the property. Everybody wanted this. He had more people coming out of the door to get that property. How were we going to get it? We did very fast and very miraculously. Uh, anyway, 
But, but the fact of the matter is, that was the, something. You could be reading along, and all of a sudden, a scripture just goes, boom! And it just has you, and you don't know why, necessarily, but you read it, and you think about it, and you meditate on it. Another time, another way is that somebody can speak to you and say something, and something can, or you could just be reading along, or you can hear it, even partially out of context, but it just jumps up in your mind, and it catches your imagination, and you think about it, okay, and you ask the Lord, what does this mean? And remember, very often, it's not going to jump up with an, un with an understanding. You're going to have to ask, why, 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 is this, why are you showing me this, Lord? What is this about? Now, God has given me spiritual, uh, you know, illumination on scriptures before where he's jumped them up, and I still don't understand them fully. Many years ago, he told me to open a Bible, and I opened a Bible to uh, Isaiah 58, I think it was. I could look and tell you exactly the chapter. And I read it, and I started to weep because it meant a whole lot to me. At that time, in that situation, and I said, was this really you, God? And I picked up another Bible and opened it to exactly the same place. And I said, is this really you? And I picked up a third Bible and opened it to exactly the same place. Without even looking, just boom, boom. Three different Bibles. Now, I don't know what all that meant. And I certainly wouldn't recommend that as a way of guidance. I just wanted to make sure that the first thing was him. Because he said, just open the Bible. Okay. And I don't know the fullness of that, but I know that it's given me a lot of comfort and everything like that. The thing is, that is a way of guidance. God can guide you through the word, but not to open it, put your finger down. That's nonsense, okay? And here's the incredibly important thing that you have to remember. There should be a deep inner peace when you are being led by the Spirit of God. There should be, now listen, that doesn't mean outer peace. Right. Because the devil and the world doesn't want you following your Heavenly Father's leading. Okay? So there can be a great deal of outer, outward opposition. Okay? But you have an inner peace to keep walking the way you're walking. Um, and uh, we didn't talk about that lady that was last time that was called to go to South America and had all the opposition that we... I can't remember her, this lady's name, but it is one of the most amazing testimonies. Her, her father was dying, her mother was going insane. What, 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 what were all the things going on? Her mother was, was just upset because her dad was in bad situations. And, and, but it, was he sick and dying? He was very, very ill. Yeah, okay. Very right. Ill. Well, I think you're not remembering it because her mother started to just get crazier and crazier. And wasn't there, there was something else too. She had an infant who had problems. Right, yeah. Uh, all these things, God told her to go, follow her husband or whatever, right. to South America, to the mission field, and everything in the world started to go against her. I mean, just opposition on every... But she had that inner peace she kept holding on to. And she went through and every bit of it just disappeared. Right after it was, she got on the boat and everything, everything just, da, da, da. okay. But the devil is using all these things in her life to just absolutely try to stop her. So remember, inner peace is not necessarily outer peace, okay. The devil does not want you to do what your heavenly father wants you to do. The devil does not want you to get the blessings and see the miracles. He wants to stop you. So you hold on to that inner peace. And the way you learn that inner peace and learn to hold on to that inner peace is by the practice of talking to God and listening to God. All those little things I talk about. Asking God, what do I do here? What? You become more and more familiar with that hope. You become that sheep that always hears the voice of the shepherd. Okay? And, and that's practicing. Practicing listening. By inviting him and asking him everything you do, you get more and more attuned to that so that when, when something is really important, you can hear it. Okay. Uh, and then <clears throat> confirmations. Confirmations can come by the word of prophecy. But wait. Let me just say this. This is really important. And I think I may have mentioned stuff like this before. The vast majority, of, according to what I personally experienced, 
and what numerous other ministers I've had talk, heard talk about it, the vast majority of what passes for prophecy in the church is really, really not anointed guiding words from God. Okay? It's just not sorrow. People say things that make you feel good. People say things that make them feel good. People say things so they can be seen to be a prophet. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of blather that goes forth that really doesn't bear any fruit at all. It's like feel good. Oh, your ship's coming in. Okay, if I could tell you how many ships I heard that were coming in that evidently were lost at sea, okay, and, and I, you know, I'm not criticizing or condemning anybody. People have to learn. You learn by doing. I get it. But just be aware. There are people, and I'm talking about the goofiest people in the church, are the people that go to meeting after meeting after meeting, always want to be prophesied over. Listen, that is not how your Heavenly Father said in the Scripture you're to be led. You're not to run around and try to get words out of people. You are to spend time with him and learn his voice. Yeah. Yes. Okay? And, and uh, you know, I have been, I've been in meetings before where and, and I try to be obedient to the authority of where I am, okay? And I've been to meetings before with pastors, 50, 60, 80 pastors, okay? And they say, all the pastors come up here, we want to pray for you. And I'll listen to this, to the, the whoever come down the line, whoever it is. And if I just hear drivel, I will pray and say, God, I don't want anything spoken over me that is not of you. I bind any lies, any confusion, or any nonsense for me. And I've seen guys come down the line and pray for every single person. You know, all your ships come in and blah, blah, blah. And they get to me and they go. And I go, that's right. Okay. And, and I guarantee you, nobody in that line ever saw anything happen that was said. It was all vague and, you know, nonsense anyway. But the thing is, there are, there are real and anointed prophets. Now, again, I, I, again, you've got to understand that people learn to prophesy. They will make mistakes. Just as I make mistakes preaching, just as everybody does. Listen, I was listening to Joyce Meyer when she wasn't even on her own. You listen to some of those old tapes and some of the things she said will make you cringe because she's just like, woo! And you go, mm. But the thing is, God didn't say you have to be perfect to preach his word. God didn't say, you know, it, you know, it's just like they say, you know, quit looking for the perfect church because if you join, it won't be perfect anymore. You know, you know, but the fact of the matter is we as the children of God, have to face the truth about these things. We have to realize, okay, the, the truth about these things. And, and understand that we're surrounded by flawed people, and there are people that, have, that really mean well, and they prophesy, and nothing comes of it, okay? And, and, and so be aware and, and face the reality. Um, it is okay to make honest thinking. Yeah, okay, way carefully evaluate. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, and this is something that almost no church does and every church is told to do. 1 Corinthians 14, 29, prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. That means in the Greek, weigh carefully means evaluate, discern, and Here's the terrible part that nobody wants to listen to. Pass judgment. That's what it means. The other prophets should say, yeah, no. It's a swing and a miss. And you know, if and you know the thing is, if the prophesier can't take that, then they're probably too immature to be, you know, raising their voice and giving guidance. Okay? We are to evaluate, discern. And pass judgment. Okay? And if somebody is in your fellowship or in your prayer meeting or whatever like that, and they continually do this, you need to say, Brother, I love you, but we need you to stop. Okay? Or submit what you're going to say ahead of time. Okay? Because we want the body to be edified. Look, I love you. 
I know I don't know your names. That's me. I'm pathetic. I admit it. But I love you. You're my brothers and sisters in the Lord. And you know, I want to feed you the true edifying word of God. I don't want to feed you marshmallows and fluff and styrofoam. Okay? I want to feed you the truth. And I want to, as much as in my power, keep you from being diverted. Because I'm going to tell you something. We're human beings. You know, the, a long time ago, God, I believe God gave me this. He said I, that the two key components of leftism, liberalism, leftism, is their refusal or failure to understand human nature and their refusal or failure to understand history. Okay? The fact of the matter is that the people that are liberals, liberal Christians, you know, Christians, or whatever, they don't really accept the truth about human nature. And it is our nature that we can sit there and hear the hard, true word for an hour, and somebody can open their mouth and say some fluffy, gooey thing, and that's all you'll leave with. That's our nature. We like the fluffy, gooey things. Okay? Ooh, ooh, that's so good. Okay? But if you get too much of that, it'll rot you from the inside. Okay? And, and you can't have too little of it. Okay? None is, is exactly how much you should have. We want the truth. God, God disciplines those whom he loves. God does not puff up anybody ever. Okay? You know, one of the things I tell people is we never lie to our kids. And I mean, we never lie to our kids. I mean, when they brought us up one of their little drawings, Dad, isn't that nice? I did not lie to them about what it was. I wasn't cruel. I didn't go, why you know that? You need to give this up. You're terrible. No, no. But I never, ever told them lies about their artwork. Okay? I never told them that when they were trying to do a somersault and they went over sideways, that that was the, oh, good job. No. I said, here, let me help you. Here, let me, this is good, but what about this? Okay? And, and consequently, everything was about growing and everything was about learning. I did not lie to my kids. I didn't lie to them about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or any of that. They never learned any of that. They were told to keep quiet around other kids, but they didn't. And consequently, they still call and ask for our opinions. Do you know why? Because they know we never lie to them. See? And it, because we love them. They go, well, I can trust you. Okay? And God honored it. Okay? God does not want you to walk around under the shadow of a lie, any kind of a lie. Okay? God does not want you thinking things about yourself or about others that aren't true. God is a God of truth. All lies are from who? The Father of that's right. All lies. That's right. Somebody said all back there. That's exactly right. All lies. Every single lie is from the same place. And I've said this too many times. You trace back all the human misery and suffering and destruction besides natural disasters, and you can trace all of it to lies. Where do you think wars come from? They come from lies. Okay? Where do you think strife and family breakups come from? They come from lies. There's lies at the root of all of it. Okay? God hates lies. Okay? And that's why it says in Revelation, all liars go to hell. Let's, let's be honest about this. And, you know, and there's no like, well, 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 they meant well. Okay? So what? You still have to say, no, that's wrong. That's, you know, that's out of bounds. That, that's not valid. That wasn't from the Spirit of God. I understand you meant well. But, you know, understand, this was not God. Okay. Number four, practicality. Practicality. From the root word, practical. Right? Okay, now, this is, I've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but I'm going to talk to you about it more. I don't know, and again, I've hung around with very few of you. But I have had a long history with a lot of different people in a lot of different churches. And hyper-spirituality 
is what it's called by some, and spookiness is a more common name. You ever been around a Christian that every time they look up in the clouds, they see the Last Supper or Jesus or a cross or something all the time? Okay, that every number they see on the side of a building or, you know, blade of grass that's crossed with another one is some kind of sign. You know what I'm talking about here? People that are always seeing stuff, reading stuff into things that is just obtuse and not there. People... That's hyper-spirituality. That's spookiness. Those are people that are looking for things that aren't there. Now, I know that occasionally you can look up in the clouds and see a unicorn. But it's very, very, very rare. Okay? Um, and the fact of the matter, I mean, I've been around people that just did that kind of stuff all the time. Well, what does that mean? What does this mean? Oh, grow up. God does not want to lead you that way. God wants to speak to you, and you're supposed to hear his voice. Not, ooh, look. Okay? I, when I've gotten prophesied over a bunch of times, and there have even been people that have supplied the tape or written verse somebody, you know, in the in the church organization that wrote it down, they made transcripts or whatever like that. I don't know where any of those tapes are. I don't know where any of those transcripts are. I didn't try to remember any of them. You know why? Because I don't need to. You know why? Because I didn't promise that to myself. I'm not going to make it come to pass. If God said it, it'll happen. And if God said it and it happens and he wants to remember that he told me before, he'll remind me. That's not the word of God unless it's the word of God. And if it's the word of God, I don't have hardly anything to do with it, do I? Okay? So I don't need to remember them and write them down and read them over and everything. That is the road to deception. Because you're elevating something some goofball said, and you don't know, maybe they're completely goofball, but that you're elevating something, they may be having a bad day. Doesn't matter, but you're elevating it above this, and more importantly, above the inner voice that you're supposed to be listening to. But if it's God, you don't need to know. You know? It's like my wife. When my, the Lord told my wife that we were going to have children. We were actively trying not to have children. And he said, you're going to have a child when you're 30. And she went, okay. She didn't tell me. Why would she tell me? If God said it's going to happen, I, there's no point in telling me. None at all. Okay? That was wise and gracious of her. And guess what? Bang! Years later, happened. Exactly on his timing, exactly what he said. Okay, without any, you know, uh, 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 you know, either of us having anything to do with it, you know, to try to make it happen. God did it. Okay, this is God. This is how God wants to work. He doesn't want your help, and He doesn't want outside help. So when don't don't allow yourself to fall into that hyper spiritualization, spooky behavior trying to find things and look for things and everything. The Spirit of God is how you're to be led. The Spirit of God Amen. inside you. He is there with you every day. When you go to sleep, He's there. When you wake up, He's there. He's there wanting to talk to you. Let Him talk to you. Develop that. Don't look around thinking that it's going to happen all externally. Okay? If it does... That means you, if you are being led primarily by external things, that means you need to grow up and get into the meat, okay? You are still a child, okay? So talk to God and develop that inner hearing, okay? It was voice. Again, I mentioned open doors. We don't want that. And again, and I cannot emphasize this too much, inner peace, that deep inner peace. When we're led by the Spirit, that peace, Will, will be stronger and clearer than all the nonsense outside. Okay? You know, I've known Paul longer than I've known my wife. Significantly. Paul and I got teamed up before my wife and I got teamed up. Okay? And when I heard that Paul had had that stroke, as I mentioned, I was flooded with concerns on all kinds of blood. Okay, practical, everything. And yet, 
And I had to force myself to focus on the peace of my heart. And I did. Okay? And the devil's like, but you know, he's just chattering. You know, but what about this? But what about that? And I'm, no, peace. Okay? And that is there for you too. I am not special. The same Holy Spirit is in you that's in me. And he wants to do the same thing for you that he does for me. Okay? He's there with you now. And you'll get better the more you practice. And then faith. Our part in the kingdom. We are not Moses. We don't have pillars of fire. A cloud. And, you know, all those kinds of things going on. But I, I'm... I'm glad. Okay. Um, it's easy and fun to share the things that God has done after the fact. But God does not want us to live on the things that he's done. He wants us to continually experience new things in him all the time. God wants to do new things, bigger things, and better things. And I speak to people about hearing the voice of God and listening to the voice of God and being led by the Spirit of God. And the thing that I hear over and over and over again is but how can I be sure? How can I be sure it's God? Uh, you know, how will I know? <clears throat> I get this. <coughs> Being sure means that there's no faith in, involved. Now I know that kind of sucks. I can't tell you how much, how many times I wanted to be sure. We all like being sure. We all like having a program, making a list, having an agenda. We like to be sure. That's our human nature. And that's how religions are built out of the life, the living Christianity, is that I want to be sure. I want to be sure this service goes the way I want it to go, so this is it, okay? I want to be sure. Every time I come to preach, I really would like God to give me a complete outline of everything I'm going to say. I really would like that. I want to be sure. But the fact of the matter is, I can't be sure and walk in faith. Because walking in faith means I have to choose to believe God's word, God's voice, God's leading. And I have to continue to choose that. That is faith. Choosing to believe. If it's, you know, I don't have to choose to believe anything if it's already decided. Okay? But the fact of the matter is that we have to learn that that's how we're led. That's how we move. That's how we move in Him, is walking. It's impossible to please God without faith. The Word of God says it is impossible to please God without faith. It is impossible. You can never please your Heavenly Father without faith. Never, never, never. You can't do it. No one can do it. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough right things. You cannot please God without faith. Amen. And faith means you don't get to know for sure. It means you have to listen. You have to be led step by step. Trusting in the grace of God. Going where the shepherd leads. That's how you please God. And he gets excited and he gives you blessings because of that. And he opens doors for you to go through that seem to be closed. Okay? Because you go up to that door and go, well, I don't see any way God can do that. But, and there you go. You're in. Okay? That's God. Okay? Being led by the Spirit of God. And it means that you go bang into that door and you go, well, I still know the Spirit of God's in me. I go to that. Bang, you go to that door. Well, I don't know. Still, I know God's leading me. Bang, you go to that well, I've still got it. And then this one's open. Okay? And, but you hold on to that. You know, you, God closing those doors, he didn't have to let them run into closed doors. But he was growing them in their faith, in their perseverance, in their character. Okay? Because they were holding on and following the voice of the shepherd. Okay? And, and it you don't get to go, okay, I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to do. Okay, which door's open? I'm going to go through that one. Nuh-uh. Okay? 
You try, you listen, you make the best choice you can, and you hold on. And if you go through a door and you start feeling bad, turn around and go out the door. There have been times when I was going to take my wife out somewhere. And we go out and we get four or five blocks from home. I go, no, I just feel bad about this. We're going back home. Turn right around and go home. And then guess what? Somebody comes over and needs ministry or something. Sometimes nothing like that happens. But I know when I turn around, I immediately feel better. Okay? That's happened a handful of times where we were just going to go do what we thought was okay. And God says, uh uh. I don't know if we, we avoided a car accident or a fight or a broken down car. I don't know. Or if it was just God wanting to lead us. Okay? But as soon as I turn away, the peace returns. So I try to keep sense of that. God wants to lead you that way. Our biggest error is not failing to hear. It's refusing to act. God doesn't want to add sin to your account. God wants you to want him to see his will coming to pass through your acts. Your faith is like a rudder on the ship. It's pretty useless unless the ship is moving. You've got to get up and be willing to move and be willing to row. The most amazing things happen if you will stand in faith. And remember, faith has to do with the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay? You speak and agree with God. Can we see the video now? Square to the left, yeah. On death row, Billy Moore's execution date was set for May 24th, 1984. No more appeals, no more court dates, no more postponements. Then a few weeks before his execution, he says there was one thing he felt the Lord told him to do. Write a letter of apology to his victim's family. How do you write somebody and apologize?